I just want to uh, up front, I'm, I'm, I am smart in that I know that many other people that work with me are the ones that do the yeoman's work, and I'm very much dependent on, on them for what I'm presenting today, and that I've got some excellent sponsors. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has sponsored a lot of very large-scale studies that we've did, done some of them and uh, helped us advance a little bit on our knowledge on drug-involved driving. And uh, they've been supported by these other agencies, including Phase Group, the ONDCP, who have contributed to the National Roadside Survey activities. So I want to talk a little bit about the National Roadside Survey that was done in 2007. The 2013-14 one has just concluded the field, and it'll be a, a couple months before we get that report out. And we also did a case con classic case control study of, uh, on the Borkenstein model uh, for every driver who was interviewed who is involved in a crash. We went out and got two non-crash involved drivers a week later, same direction of travel, time of day, day of week, to, to try to see if we could really isolate the contribution of drugs rather than situational variables uh, to, to crash risk. And uh, You've got a, heard, already heard a lot about the background, so I don't need to do that. We're building on the, the roadside survey, we're building on the th three previous roadside surveys done in the U.S. where trend analyses can be done because we've adhered to the same basic uh, methodological approach to uh, gathering these, this data that's representative of the U.S. Night, uh, crash involved driving in, as a whole for the lower 48 states. So that's allowed us to look at the trends and you can see, whoops, that's not the, you can see down here, well, I'm gonna point with a different one. Let's see if I can do this two-handed. I can't do it one-handed. Can you see that? So oh, 73, 36% were positive for alcohol, 26 and 86, 17 and, and 96, 2007, there's an additional drop as well. And uh, just looking back here at these, the, the, the reductions have come at all levels of, in, of uh, intensity. So the, the <coughs> higher levels have come down just as much as the lower levels have, and it leads to a quandary as to why the fatal crashes in the FAR system haven't come down as rapidly in the last two measures of the, of the, of the um, national prevalence. Doug and I use a very similar uh, method methodology. We share our approaches and, and profit from one another's experiences. And we did do a pilot study in 2005 to try to break through some of the objections or barriers we thought there, there might be to being able to collect drug-involved driving. And we found that we could get people not only to give us breath and oral fluid, but also, to my amazement, blood. So I stupidly had this in the pilot study. That's how stupid I am because now NHTSA wants us to get dr blood every time as well. And there's an additional hassle factor there. So we used, I mentioned already using a similar protocol for the alcohol part of it. We put the alcohol measurements at the very front end, both to uh, soften up the s subjects, you know, get them comfortable with us, but also so we can use the same sequence of questions and procedures as we did in previous roadside surveys. So, and Doug has added mid midweek days, we've added one period and weekday drug use to look at how that might be different. So we all know the basic reasons we're going after these. The sampling thing is carefully designed to be actually it's a stratified random po uh, sample of the lower 48 U.S. states to be representative of, of them across that part of the U.S. And this is where we have collected our data all across the country, 60 different sites, five locations within each site. These are the times of day. We go 
late night, Friday and Saturday, early morning, Saturday, late night, Sunday, early morning, and then we randomly select either mid-morning or mid-afternoon in each of these 60 jurisdictions. So it's, it's standard protocol in terms of human subject issues. Our goal was 7,500 drivers providing oral fluid, so we get more for breath, less for blood, but it gives us a, a pretty good sample size. We looked at a, we do, we gather the, the oral fluid and blood and send it off to a lab for analysis and do fairly sophisticated analyses on a broad variety of drugs. I'll show you later. If we find somebody who's O5 or, O5 or above, we don't arrest them, but we get them home. So I just want to focus on this lower one here. One of our concerns was the, the in 86 and 96, nearly 95 percent or more of people provided alcohol samples for us, and then it was about 86 percent in in 2007. We were concerned we were getting the wrong, missing the wrong, some of the high risk people. We did a study of we did build in. $100 incentive to convert some hard refusals throughout the survey so we could analyze those data. And then we did some other efforts to see if there was a problem. So I'm not going to go through those because we can just talk about that sometime offline. This is our procedure. We use a breath test, oral fluid collection, and they do the questionnaire, ser several questionnaires, self-report on that, and also private. They're enter entering it themselves because there are controversial questions. We have teams that have, we have to have a phlebotomist, you, you might see there. The police have the same general role that Doug says, but in the 2013-14, life has changed. So those, that's a little bit different there. This is just an example of what we do to s sketch where we're going to go at these sites where the police have helped us identify them. We try to encourage our data collectors not to leave the equipment on top of cars. <laughs> We do have a very expert uh, phlebotomist. This is a, a prevalence study, not a risk study. We don't know beans about what the extent to which these dr drugs increase risk. And, and again, we may talk a bit about that tomorrow afternoon because I think that deserves some, some, uh, some careful attention. This is the 2007 data, you know, we got 72 percent gave us oral fluid and then 40, about 40 percent gave us blood. Response rates somewhat similar to Doug's. And then we looked at, we grouped our dr drugs into different drug classes and categories because we looked at, at quite a few drugs. And with all those drugs, well, there's so many cells to try to look at and to compare, and most of them are re fairly low prevalence, so you need to combine them to be able to do any analyses anyhow. So just a few of those results. And uh, day see, we found in daytime, if we just look at the, the complement of the negative, so it's 11 percent were positive in day, and in the, f on this graph, uh, what is it, 14.4 were positive in nighttime. And illegal drugs, these were present both in day and night. night the number we, you hear from Fay and the one that's m most often quoted is nighttime. It's taking oral fluid and or blood. W w if it showed up in one or the or both or the other, it got into it. It's the most robust estimate we can come up with. And 16.3% were positive in 2007. Illegal drugs were 12.4% were because in, in the illegal and medications, almost all of these had marijuana and some, uh, some other drug. We find that it's late night is when the prevalence is the highest. We found we've already talked about uh, differences in age groups, but here in terms of uh, gender, males have higher rates. And uh, but but women have higher ra rates on the 
males have higher for for uh, for illegal, lower for medications. The females pr predominate there, and daytime or nighttime. Uh, the, the, it's even more dramatic when you look at gender and age by prevalence. It's not up on there right now. I'm not going to search for that slide. But uh, it, the, it really falls into a, the soccer mom platitude. But daytime data collection, the women have much higher prescription drug rates than they do at nighttime. And uh, it, it's a different population that's driving at that time. But the, and the higher rates were in the middle age groups. So now this, this illustrates that if you're positive for drugs, you're m more likely to be positive at the, w with uh, alcohol positive. So in other words, more people are combining or a higher proportion of people are combining alcohol and drugs than the people who are single doing it. In, single sub category of substance. And that, so a lot of the alcohol-related people that may be in, identified and arrested also have drugs on board, but we just don't know as much about that. This is, these are the prevalence estimates, and it just uh, illustrates how low they are for some of the specific drugs. But these are the top two in this survey. Marijuana was the highest or in, at 8.65 percent. Cocaine was really remarkably high we thought at 4%, but Doug talked about 32%, I think it was, in Canada. So I don't know what's going on there other than it's another type of uh, lengthy uh, geographic, where am I on time, four minutes left? Good. Well, the suffering can end for you guys soon. So I want to just talk a little bit about self-report here. And we asked the people about their use of, of a variety of drugs on self-report, and these are, this table is about everyone, everyone in this table was positive for the drug that's in their, their category. So of um, antidepressants, 85% uh, daytime and two-thirds nighttime admitted to using them. Amphetamines, none of the daytime and 2% of the nighttime of these people who were positive told us that they were using amphetamines. Uh, benzos, it's a little it's sort of halfway in between. Cocaine, it's, it's a little bit more acceptable to them to report it that than, than amphetamines. And it goes on. But it just, just points out that look, using self-report me measures may be, have some flaws in terms of what the a estimate actually is. Trends of them may be meaningful. You'll know if it's going up or down, but you don't know what's out there need the biological specimens, even if you are going to be confused or accused of getting people's DNA and planting chips in their mouth. I just put this one up so it's not significant because the numbers are very small, but motorcycles had by far the highest uh, drug positive rates. So there's some reports about that, and then the drug Drug crash risk, if I'm really, r r I have like two minutes left. Just, just to, this is a, a, a different sort of illustration of the druid trying to relate the, the different types of drugs to the risk associated with alcohol, ranges of alcohol. I just want to point out, they were, though they attempted to get identical methodology throughout their these eight, 18 countries that participated, there were lots of pretty major differences in it, but it gets reported as if it was all the same. And some of these estimates on a, uh, on a nationwide basis are based on very few positives, like one or two positives, and they estimate thir you know, a high elevated crash risk, and then that goes into a nation-to-nation -nation uh, analysis where it's not weighted by size, sample size. So it's a little bit crazy, but it still gives you something to chew on. And we'll chew on that maybe again tomorrow afternoon. And this is one of my colleagues. I'm one of the guilty authors on this, where they related the roadside survey to FARS data, highly selective on states 
where we did the survey and that it high, had high reporting levels. And they show risks under true odds ratios, a few that are relatively are significant but not high risk. And then when you adjust it for uh, demographics and so on, they stop, start dropping off the system. But all drugs, you have a slightly increased risk. Marijuana, there's no risk. You can see it's z below one, below one. And then uh, drugs other than marijuana, it's a higher risk than for marijuana in this analysis that's a ex post, you know, archival data analysis. We're, we're in the midst of doing a drug crash risk study for NHTSA and others. The, the study I started out describing, we've collected the data, we've written the reports, it's in final review, it actually will come out. And they, so we had some of the stupid subjects, that they, look at this guy, and he still is as fat now as he was when he did that a couple of years ago. So he can't learn anything from life and embarrassing pictures. <laughs> this is the only result I'm going to show you from this, and then I'll sit down. This is this study that I was just describing, the crash risk study. And the, the red line here is the curve that was done in, with Bl by Blomberg and Moskowitz on an alcohol-only crash risk study, case control study. Then these other two lines come from our study. And was when we, I had this plot done right when we first got the data set we could analyze because I was scared to death that our, we, weren't implement, we didn't have a design that was consistent and effective uh, because everything was so much more complicated by drugs. But the curves are virtually identical. There are just a f few points where they're different. But if, if I can, I'm failing on my pointing. The, the, the other two lines, the green line is, is based on, on uh, all, well, let me see, the black line, I'll say that first, is based on all alcohol, po all drivers, excluding those who are drug positive. So it's an alcohol curve not contributed to by, uh, by drugs. We've, we've always had our previous estimates. We didn't know whether drugs were present or not. But this shows that the curves are, it, this curve is almost identical to the curve that's, that's, that, ha, that was done before. And then our other curve that's even closer to identical is the, the, the one with drugs in it. It's, there's no statistical difference, but it's sort of ironic. But with drugs present, the risks are a little bit lower on this curve. I've got some other stuff to talk about, but 30 seconds or just should I quit? Thank you ever so much. <laughs>